That shit ain't gonna happen. When that happens, then uh, it happened. But right now, we's gonna keep moving forward and focus on what we gotta focus on. If that for heaven present itself, then cool. But if not, it, it's been too much talk for too long. So is it, it's like a business thing, like the business not matching up, or you just don't, don't feel really, like? I have no idea. I, I don't have no idea. I don't even think about it anymore. Are, are you looking at the other I got champions? Donald Carroll and um, about six and a half, seven weeks. So that's that's what we gonna focus on. Um, with that being said, if it's not tanked after, if you get past Jonah Care, are you looking at the other champions? I like? feel the same way about them too. This shit not gonna happen. If it happens, then we gonna fight. If not, then oh well. well why, why does it seem like you know you're like saying it, if it happens, if it doesn't happen? Because because it, it's politics in boxing. I I, I, ain't, I ain't stressing my brain mm -hmm. about fighting the other champion if if I know it's politics involved. I'm stress so it's, it's just for no reason. So it's just not just Pink's side, it's everyone's side. Yeah, it's, not just, it's, not, it's not just Dave's side, it's everybody's side. It's all of championships, champion side. Every champion is on a different side of the board. Everybody got different promoters. What, um, what about Alberto Machado? Then they Golden Boy come over to the zone. And they, and they I mean, that can happen, but that's not a unification. Here we have the most recent set of comments from IBF Super Featherweight Champion Tevin Farmer in regards to not just the Javante Davis fight, but potential fights with the other champions that are out there in the weight class. And Tevin Farmer made it very clear that he's not even going to stress himself anymore. He's not going to waste his time on it because ultimately the politics of boxing are what prevent those fights from happening. Thus, it's just a lot of unnecessary stress for no reason. Look, Tevin Farm already tried to make a fight like that happen with another champion in the weight class. We all know this. And I've talked about it extensively here on the channel. I'll leave the links to those videos in the description box in case you're interested. Ben talked about that shit. In those videos, I detail how, you know, before it even became a, a, a PBC versus Matchroom slash the zone thing, before it even became about that, Tevin Farmer wanted that Javante Davis fight. And they, you know... They blew him off, basically. They blew him off. They weren't interested in making that fight. They told him to go get a belt. He goes to get a belt, comes back, and he's no closer to the fight with Davis with the belt than he was without it. Why, you ask? The politics of boxing. So if you've already tried to bring about a fight like that, and it's been a while now, you know, it's been going on for a while now. This isn't something that just started happening. This isn't a recent development. We're at least two years into, a, in, into this conversation. Uh, if you've been trying to do this for a while now, and it's been to no avail, you're no closer today to that fight than you were a year ago or two years ago. If you're looking at this, but now you're a world champion, and now you're on the same platform as a Canelo Alvarez, as a Anthony Joshua. Do you want to keep chasing people? I'm not wasting any more time on that shit. I've spent enough time chasing around Javante Davis only to pick up where I left off with some of these other guys that are out there. No thanks! You can argue. That because there were two other champions in the weight class, one being WBC champion Miguel Burchelt and the other being WBO champion Masayuki Ito, you can argue that Tevin Farmer should try his luck with them and see if they are more receptive. But if you're Tevin Farmer and you've already spent all this time and all this energy into cornering Javante Davis, the prospect of having to do that again with someone else who may not even be receptive just like Javante wasn't receptive. The prospect of having to go through all of that again is gonna seem kinda irritating. So if you're Tevin Farmer, you might be thinking to yourself that you know what? If one of these other belt holders in this weight class want to have a fight with me, they got a mouth, they know where to find me, they know who I fight for and where I fight. So let them come look for me the way I went looking for Javante Davis. And if they do, then let's talk. Let's do it. That's really what it sounds like to me and based on the sequence of events, the chronology of everything, I can hardly blame him. It would be intellectually dishonest of me to completely overlook 
how hard Tevin Farmer has tried to bring about that fight at Super Featherweight. It would be intellectually dishonest of me to know these things and 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 ignore them. That look, the guy already tried to get it popping with, with another belt holder in the weight class and nothing happened. So if you're sitting where he's sitting, your focus is gonna be, you know what? I tried it, it didn't work. Politics of boxing, yada yada yada. I'ma focus on my own career. I'ma build my own brand. I'ma raise my own marquee value so that when the time comes, they will have to come to me. Fighting me will be their incentive because by that time I will have built up my marquee value so much that they'll have to come to me. If you're Tevin Farmer, the prospect of having to chase around another belt holder that may or may not be receptive due to the politics of boxing, the prospect of having to pick up where you left off and do that again, it's not gonna seem appealing. So the most I can say about Tevin Farmer's recent comments is, I can't blame the guy, I really can't. Not given everything that's gone on so far, I can't blame him. Hopefully the situation at Super Featherweight changes. Hopefully either Miguel Burchelt or Masayuki Ito, you know, that's the WBC and WBO champions. Hopefully one of them extends the cross-promotional olive branch to give us a unification fight. But as it stands today, if you're Tevin Farmer and you've been trying to make a fight like that happen already with one of the other belt holders, if you've been doing that steadily, time after time, week after week, month after month, arguments on social media, arguments in person, if you've been doing that shit already and it didn't work, then how much sense would it make to keep doing that shit? You know that I'm surprised the interviewer, whoever conducted this interview, I'm surprised they even asked that question because at this point in the juncture, we should all be fully aware of what's been going on and what's holding up the fight. I mean, wasn't it Leonard Ellerby that said, and I quote, what the fuck do we need with the zone? So if, if, you, if you know this, then why ask such a stupid fucking question? <laughs> Moving on. In other news, I'm sure most of you have heard already because the rumors have been rampant since this morning and apparently those rumors, they checked out. Abner Mares has pulled out of the Javante Davis fight. He's not going to be fighting him in two weeks. Oh, no. And the story is that he acquired an injury to his elbow in sparring and that injury is preventing him from participating in that fight oh, no. with Javante. Thus, they've conjured up yet another 126 pound fighter for Javante Davis to fight. Another one? Hugo Ruiz, who just fought on the Manny Pacquiao versus Adrian Brona undercard. You might have caught that fight, you might not have caught that fight, but he fought on that undercard. And he, like Abner Mares, is a 126 pound fighter. Now we're gonna get to that, but for now, uh, passing thoughts on Abner Mares pulling out. Whether you think he got cold feet, or you think that the injury is legitimate, one way or another, this wasn't a fight that I was excited about. This wasn't a fight that I was checking for. So I could fucking care less as to what the real reason is that Abner Mahrez pulled out of the fight. I don't care about that shit because to me this ain't nothing but a showcase fight. This fight ain't no different than the Cuellar fight. Not to me. The only difference between this fight and the Cuellar fight is while Abner Mahrez might have been a little bit more active than Cuellar was when he fought Javante, at the end of the day they're both 126 pound fighters and they were both coming off of losses. Cuellar was coming off a loss to Abner Mahrez and Abner Mahrez currently is coming off a loss to Leo Santa Cruz in their rematch. So, you know, this fight didn't mean shit to me. I don't know if it meant anything to you. And the only real difference between what we got from the Cuellar fight and what we would have got from the Mahrez fight is that Mahrez has a bigger name than Cuellar. That's the only real difference. It's still a showcase fight. It's still you guys conjuring up 126 pound fighters to pad Javante Davis's resume and make him look good. But make him look good to people that don't know any better because Cuellar, like Mares, is not a 130 pound fighter and neither is the guy that's standing in for Mares, Hugo Ruiz. Hugo Ruiz is coming off of three consecutive victories, the most recent being the one on the Pacquiao versus Adrian Broner undercard, and Hugo Ruiz is a statuesque guy for 126 pounds. You know, this, this guy's about five foot nine. That's, that's a tall drink of water for that weight class. So, you know, yeah, he might fill out to 130, but at the end of the day, the question remains the same. What has he done at 130 pounds that warrants him getting a title shot? Absolutely nothing! Oh, 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 I know, I know. Extenuating circumstances, right? He's just standing in 
for for Abner Mares. Okay, what has Abner Mares done to get a title shot? Lose to Leo. You know that Javante Davis is the WBA 130 pound champion. He's the WBA super featherweight champion. And my question is, at what point does the WBA step in and start ordering this guy to fight 130 pound fighters? At what point do they step in and order him to, at minimum, fight a fucking mandatory so he can fight someone from his own fucking weight class instead of padding his resume or attempting to with 126 pound fighters? You know they bill Javante Davis, they try to sell him to you as this devastating puncher. And I'm not saying that he's not. But what I am saying is you make him look that much better when you match him against fighters from the weight class below his. And that's where the smoke and the mirrors are. That you guys seem hell-bent to keep Javante Davis fighting with fighters from 126 pounds instead of the guys in his own weight class. And that's got to be deliberate. I mean, it's got to be. From Cuellar to Mares, Mares pulls out, you conjure up yet another 126 pound fighter. I mean, he might be taller than Mares was, and he's even taller than Javante Davis. You know, Hugo Ruiz is taller than Javante Davis. But all the same, you done both fucking diddly in this weight class. So, you can hypothesize what's gonna happen if a hard shot gets through for Javante Davis on Hugo Ruiz. Hugo's not gonna be prepared to take it because he's not accustomed to it. He is not a 130 pound fighter. He hasn't fought anyone good there, let alone a power puncher. It used to be, you know, right after that Pedraza fight, Javante Davis really put the boxing fans on notice. That was a very good win for him. And he followed up that win by defending his newly obtained title against the undefeated Liam Walsh. Now, he received some criticism for the Fonseca fight, but Fonseca, like Walsh, like Pedraza, was undefeated. So there was still kind of wiggle room to bounce back from some of the negative press that he was getting. But altogether, it really has been a downward spiral, at least in the court of public opinion, that what Javante Davis seems to be doing these days is not fighting, and when he is fighting, he's fighting guys that ain't even from his weight class. So they're not actually trying to make him a better fighter. In fact, they may be hampering his growth as a fighter because they keep using all this creative matchmaking to sell him to you. Essentially, iron sharpens iron, right? Well, that's not what they're doing with Javante. They're not matching him against the best and brightest in the division to really test his mettle. What they're doing is using smoke and mirrors so that they can make you believe that he's the best guy there. You know, it is what it is, man. It's been well over a year. If it hasn't been a year, it's been over a year since Javante Davis actually fought a 130-pound fighter. Do you realize that? Do you guys realize that? That Javante Davis has not squared off against a legitimate 130-pound fighter since August of 2017. It's been over a year since this guy actually fought someone who is from his weight class. You know, it is what it is, man. I've been saying it, I'm gonna keep saying it. It's smoke and mirrors. And it, it kind of looks, I'll tell you that, if they keep that shit up, if they don't give this kid the opportunity to grow because he's a young fighter, at the end of the day, he's still a young fighter. But if they really don't allow him to develop because they're either shelving him so that they don't have to deal with anybody or matching him against, you know, <clears throat> guys that are there for a check or guys that they know don't stand a chance, no hopers. If they keep putting him in those kinds of situations, he's really not gonna grow as a fighter. And at some point, it'll come back to bite them in the ass. In other news, Reigning WBA Women's Middleweight Champion Christina Hamm is going to be returning to the ring in a few weeks on February 9th in what is her first fight since pulling out of the Clarissa Shields fight with that medical condition. There's not really a lot of details out there as far as what is the nature of the condition. How would that have hampered her from uh, participating in that fight with Clarissa? Because that was a fight of considerable value. That is a fight that a lot of fight fans want to see. That's the kind of fight that would bring attention to women's boxing. The build-up, the animosity, the rivalry. All the essential ingredients for a decent-sized fight are there between Clarissa and Christina. And yet, there was a medical condition that got in the way of all that on the eve of the fight. Well, you know, she pulled out, we know that much, and now she's going to be coming back on February 9th. And this is kind of flying largely under the radar. You know, most people don't realize that she's got a fight coming up, and it's probably because the fight isn't going to be here in America. It's going to be over there in Berlin, Germany, against Elaine Sikmeshvili, a fighter with a professional record of eight wins, seven losses. And six of those losses came by way of knockout. Thus, you can look at this fighter's professional record and come to the conclusion that this can be nothing other than a tune-up fight. A tune-up fight for Christina Hammer, who is coming back to the ring. So these are just my passing thoughts. Feel free to disagree. But I'm not actually mad 
that Christina Hammer is tuning up with somebody. Oh, really? Even someone like this. I I'm not mad that she's tuning up with an opponent that has a record like this one because in the sport of women's boxing, you kind of have less to choose from depending on the circumstances. It's not unusual for entire weight classes to have a scarcity of opponents, especially when all you're really looking for is someone to tune up with, someone to get some rounds in with so that you can get your juices going again. You know, in women's boxing, the higher up you go in weight classes, the bigger the scarcity in opponents is. Especially if you're just looking for someone to tune up with. You know, there might actually be talented fighters in your weight class. Talented up-and-comers, talented champions, contenders. There might actually be those kinds of people in your weight class. But if all you're looking to do is tune up, well, these are the kinds of opponents, the only kinds of opponents, that tend to answer the call. So if you're already familiar with women's boxing and you're, you're familiar with that sometimes there's a scarcity of opponents great enough that this is what you've got to deal with, then you won't hold it against Christina, like I won't, that she's tuning up with someone like this. That's okay. I'll give her a pass on that one. But it's after this that I'm going to be paying close attention to what Christina Hammer does and says next. Is Clarissa Shields, is that fight still something that's on Christina Hammer's mind? Is that still a fight that she wants? You know, since pulling out of the fight with Clarissa Shields due to that condition or whatever was going on, Christina Hammer had to give up a WBC title. She was labeled the champion in recess, and now that WBC title that she used to hold sits with Clarissa Shields. Does Christina Hammer still have intentions of not only getting that title back, but winning the ones that Clarissa Shields has. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm going to be paying attention to. I'm not mad if you tuning up with somebody after, you know, dealing with a condition or some kind of, I'm not, you know, an injury, whatever. I'm not mad about that. But what I'm going to be looking for is the eagerness, the willingness. Is the Clarissa Shields fight something that Christina Hammer still intends to do? Is that still a fight that she wants? Is it? Because the news, the attention, and everything around that fight has dissipated as of late and it's because you know she pulled out with that condition so a lot of the momentum that the fight was gaining and it was gaining momentum very quickly a lot of that momentum has plateaued now the question is what does christina hammer intend to do after this fight there are questions to be addressed one is she gonna keep the same energy that she had before? Does she still want the Shields fight as much as she wanted it before? Two, it being that this fight that she's about to have in February is taking place in Berlin, Germany, and the Americans that were acquainted with her before, they may not even know that she's boxing again. So are they gonna have her fight one more time stateside before the Shields fight so that people can be reminded of who she is because the fight has lost a bit of momentum? Yeah. Is all that gonna have to happen first before the fight actually comes off with Shields? Those are the questions I've gotten, and we'll find out very soon.